from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. President Biden chose Cleveland as the city to deliver a speech on the economy and his proposed $1.9 trillion infrastructure and investment plan. For more on what that plan entails, our audience is across Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. Welcome, Gina Raimondo, U.S. Commerce Secretary. Secretary Raimondo, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, President Biden today said his economic plan is working to bring America out of the pandemic, but we need to invest more in education, in infrastructure to stay competitive. What are the musts that you believe need to be included? Yes, thank you. Well, this is about rebuilding for the future. I mean, the president is, of course, right. The rescue package is working. It's, it's pulling us out of the pandemic creating a half a million jobs a month, which is a fantastic pace. But we need to prepare for the future. We need to invest in child care so that people can go back to work. We still have two million women who have dropped out of the workforce. We have to make sure every American has access to broadband. The president's calling for historic investments in broadband. It's, it's, it's not OK. It's not acceptable that we still have millions of Americans without access to broadband. We need to invest um, in job training and apprenticeships so people can have the skills they need to get the jobs of today and tomorrow. And we need to invest in manufacturing so that we make critical goods such as semiconductors in America again. So, you know, it, it's not enough to um, pull ourselves out of the pandemic. It's time to rebuild, rebuild our infrastructure, rebuild for the future so Americans can compete and our and our children have a chance. And yet the counteroffer from Republicans doesn't seem much higher than the original. Where's the progress that you see and how long is it worth continuing the negotiation? Yes, well, I should say, you know, we have to give them credit. I have been involved in these discussions and in these negotiations. They're operating in good faith, and they came back to us uh, with a higher number. It is progress. There's no doubt about it. It's progress. I think if I had said to you a few months ago that Republicans would be coming back to the president with a nearly trillion-dollar counteroffer, you, you might not have believed it. So we're still at the table. We are trying. It isn't enough, as you say. Um, they're not very clear about how they propose to pay for it. And, of course, the president has been crystal clear. We're not going to tax or burden uh, middle America or middle class Americans. But, you know, our, our job is to stay at the table and to find some common ground. And so we will continue to do that. The president talked about how the administration is working to combat supply issues, combat issues with computer chips, as you mentioned, and America can't innovate without chips. You just held a summit with the companies that supply chips and the companies that need chips, from Google to Amazon to car makers. What's the next step here? So right now, as we are talking to one another, uh, the the... The piece of legislation which would fund a semiconductor fund at $52 billion is on the Senate floor. In fact, I was talking to senators before I came over here, and there is a sense of optimism that this will get across the finish line perhaps as early as today or tonight uh, to fund a CHIPS fund at $52 billion, which would come to the Department of Commerce. So, of course, it's not over till it's over, and, of course, it has to get through the House. But at this point, I think there's broad bipartisan recognition that we can't afford not to do this. I mean, think about your own life. Everything you do relies upon chips. Um, you, you know, your, your phone, your appliances, your computer, your car, artificial intelligence, not to mention the national defense application. So we have to get it done, and I believe we will get it done. Are you hearing what you want to hear from the industry? Are you getting what you need on that front? Yes, uh, yes, thank you. So as you mentioned, I convened over 35 CEOs last week, leaders in the semiconductor industry, and they have been very collaborative 
and really leaning in with us to find a solution to this problem. It's, it's an economic security problem. It's a national security problem. And I have to say thank you to everyone that we have been engaged with. They've, they've been great partners. And this will require public-private partnership. Um, we can't do it. Government can't fix this problem alone. And the private sector needs to be there. And I think they will be. GM just announced it's restarting production at several plants that had been idled due to the chip shortage. Meantime, you've got COVID cases rising in Taiwan, which is the heart of the semiconductor industry. Could that impact supply? And will the U.S. do anything to help? Well, you put your finger on a very important problem, which is that we are uh, heavily dependent on a company called TSMC, which is based in Taiwan. Uh, for a, a high percentage of our semiconductors, and which is exactly why we need to make semiconductors in America. You know, it, it, it would be our plan to build another six or seven manufacturing operations in America over time so that we won't be so vulnerable um, to, you know, relying overly on one company or one uh, country. So uh, speaking of countries, obviously improving infrastructure, improving supply chains helps to boost U.S. competitiveness against China. The administration has been reviewing its approach to China. When are we going to hear more about the findings and the strategy there? I would say that this is an ongoing process, more than a process with a you know, particular big announcement or deadline. But we're doing it now. You know, for example, uh, what we're talking about semiconductors, that's core to our strategy as it relates to China. We need to invest in America. The president's jobs plan is all about competing with China, improve our education system, improve our infrastructure, invest in manufacturing. You know, the way to compete with China is to run faster, to invest in America. Um, and then in terms of defense, we haven't slowed down. You know, in my department, we've continued to add Chinese companies to the entities list. We've uh, subpoenaed a number of Chinese companies to extract information from them. And we're going to do what we need to do to protect American industry. Meantime, the Colonial Pipeline hack has raised awareness about the vulnerability of our infrastructure to cyber attacks. What do you see as the biggest risks to businesses here? And what does your budget do to address this? Yeah. Unfortunately, this is a large and growing risk to U.S. businesses. And I think Colonial was a wake-up call to all American businesses that uh, they, need, they need to do more. And I think particularly smaller businesses uh, for, for whom it is difficult need to invest more. Um, we are investing heavily uh, at the Commerce Department in shoring up our own cybersecurity, as well as researching uh, cyber and cyber technology so that we could continue to make ourselves more secure. Now, the president also today emphasized how the administration is working to uh, protect small businesses from anti-competitive forces. The U.S. obviously has expressed concerns about big U.S. tech companies and their power. Europe also has expressed those concerns. Will big tech regulation be on the agenda for the G7? Uh, you know, that is a better question uh, for uh, the Treasury Secretary or others. I would say, for my part, um, we are heavily engaged with the EU in discussions around uh, privacy, privacy protection of data, uh, tech regulation, and the, our collaboration uh, and partnership with Europe is important. It's important for companies on both sides of the Atlantic. And so we are working, I am in constant contact with tech companies in America, to make big and small, to make sure that their interests are represented, but also with our counterparts in Europe to make sure, you know, we're allies, we, are, we have the same, same values, we believe in privacy, we believe in openness, uh, and so we are working hard with the Europeans to come to a common set of um, 
values so that we can continue to operate across the Atlantic. All right. Well, on behalf of our Bloomberg TV and radio audiences, thank you so much. U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo there. Uh, Secretary Raimondo, appreciate you taking the time. All right. Turning now to how U.S. markets performed on the day, I want to get to our Bloomberg Markets reporter, Kriti Gupta, in New York. Kriti, walk us through well, Emily, what happened out there today. <laughs> a little bit of a mixed picture, a little bit of green on the screen when you're looking at the S&P 500, but when you're looking at tech, a lot of red, and it looks like the NASDAQ was hit harder than the uh, New York Fang Index, which of course has those big tech stocks. So the SOX Index was the notable outperformer, but let's just get the macro out of the way and jump right to meme stocks, because that seems to be where all the action was especially as AMC, one of those meme stocks, hit a $10 billion valuation in its biggest intraday gain since back in January. So that idea that we were saying maybe that retail bid, maybe that's kind of in the past now, not so much. I mean, just take a look at this chart behind me from year to date. That blue line, this is an index of those meme stocks, those restricted Robinhood stocks, GameStop, AMC, Express, et cetera. The bottom, that's going to be your S&P 500. So you can really see that outperformance has not only maintained, but you're trying to see a little bit of an uptick more recently. That being said, when we're talking about the speculation, talking about the volatility, we have to talk about crypto. I want to show you what Bitcoin is doing on a one month basis, because we all remember that big kind of hit that it took last week. It looks like since then, you've started to see it trade a little bit more sideways, not a huge move up, not a huge move down, just kind of hanging in there. Let's see if that pattern continues, Emily. All right. Thanks so much, Kriti Gupta. Hanging in. All right. Coming up, all eyes on Amazon as more states build an antitrust case against the e-commerce giant. This after Washington, D.C. filed the first. We're going to talk about which attorneys general could be next. This is Bloomberg. Looking into Amazon is growing as attorneys general work to build a case showing antitrust violations for the e-commerce giant. Bloomberg News, Spencer Soper has more on the mounting state inquiries. Spencer, obviously, we know Washington, D.C. came out first. It was slightly unusual not to have other states on board there. What do we know now about what other states are looking into? Yes, yeah, so now we're just seeing kind of more states join the dog pile. Uh, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania and even Connecticut all kind of, uh, you know, looking at, at Amazon in some way or another. I don't have any any indication that they're looking at, at different things. I mean, they, they may choose to break up the investigation differently, but you figure Amazon's practices uh, affect consumers in all states, you know, e equally. I want to take a listen to part of our conversation with the Washington, D.C. Attorney General, um, where he talked about why they brought this case forward. Take a listen here to Attorney General Carl Racine. This is a D.C. case uh, that uh, D.C. attorneys and our counsel uh, worked on for over a year. Uh, we engaged with Amazon, tried as best we could to establish a cooperative relationship to gather documents and analyze the case. And at the end of the day, we felt like the case needed to be brought. Spencer, I asked Attorney General Racine if he had heard yet from other states, uh, attorneys general, and he, he it's the one question he, he didn't want to quite get to. So presumably, he, he certainly heard uh, from other states. Do we know which states might be considering bringing action at this point? Um, no, I mean, we've reported uh, that New York and California were collaborating with the federal, uh, you know, Federal Trade Commission. So we know that there's definitely some collaboration going on and precisely what they're going to look at is still unclear. But, but a lot of what I'm hearing uh, from, from folks involved in this is that there's definitely interest in uh, Amazon's algorithm on its marketplace, how Amazon decides what you see when you enter, you know, certain search terms. And is that algorithm fair? Is it always in the best interest of shopper, or is it sometimes more in the interest of, of Amazon than in the interest of its shopper or its merchant partners? And that's what's going to be at the, be at the heart of, of this in terms of the uh, consumer concerns about, about uh, these antitrust issues. Earlier this week, Amazon said that Washington, D.C. had it exactly 
backwards. What are they saying now? Yeah, I mean, they're basically saying, look, we, we face a lot of competition. We're not driving prices up. They're, they're singing the same refrain. But when you speak to merchants, and we have written about this, they'll say, look, if I have a product on Amazon that I can afford to sell for less on another site, maybe my own site, maybe my own site on Shopify, maybe on Walmart, Amazon will punish me for that. It will bury my product on its own site. And because Amazon gets so much business, they can't afford to offer lower prices on other sites to try to lure shoppers away from Amazon. Think of it as like real estate, you know, getting a better deal in a, in a low rent district compared to the premium shopping district. So that's what's happening right now is Amazon's got that premium, you know, online digital retail real estate, but it doesn't want to let any of its merchant partners offer better deals on, on other sites. And so that's kind of at the heart of this issue. Spencer, in, in the experts that you're talking to, you know, how concerned are they about big tech regulation? We spoke to Michael Pachter of Wedbush Securities, an analyst who covers Amazon. He thought that, uh, you know, Washington, D.C.'s case would go nowhere and that there wasn't sufficient proof. And yet we see other states potentially piling on. There has to be something. Yeah, they're learning more. Um, a lot of states came into this fairly cold. Uh, they have to learn w what it's like to sell on Amazon, which is completely different from a physical store. And all of the uh, aspects involved in it and the, the, the tricks that merchants use and all of these things, it's a steep, steep learning curve. So right now, the regulators are really still in that learning curve of figuring out how this thing works so that they can figure out where the potential problems are. And that's where it's slow going. They have to there's not a lot of people that fully understand it. They don't get the most cooperation from Amazon. And so they're still kind of in this in this learning phase. All right. Uh, well, uh, we'll keep following, as will you, Spencer Soper, our Bloomberg News reporter who covers Amazon. Thanks so much, Spencer. Meantime, Amazon is said to have set the date for this year's Prime Day. According to sources, the event will be held on June 21st and 22nd as the world's biggest online retailer tries to get its big summer sales back on schedule. Last year, it was pushed to October due to the pandemic. And coming up, get ready to switch to a new Switch. We're going to have details of Nintendo's plans to upgrade the popular gaming console. And let's take a look at some tech results out now. Salesforce, HP Inc., and VMware all reporting after the bell. Salesforce projecting annual profit that would top. Analyst estimates suggesting customers are optimistic about emerging from the pandemic. Not as rosy for HP Inc. Falling after hours after its projection for free cash flow fell short of estimates. And VMware beat the street in the first quarter with revenue. This is Bloomberg. Best Buy thinks it can succeed where rival Walmart has failed by asking its store employees to deliver online orders to customers' homes. The move will help the retailer cope with a surge in digital orders, which are often fulfilled through its stores. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Matt Boyle for more. So, Matt, how exactly will this work? Yeah, so uh, what Best Buy is doing is uh, asking its employees if they'd like to, instead of, you know, working the sales floor or restocking products, uh, if they'd like to uh, grab a, a couple of online orders uh, in the store and take them uh, to an employee's house. Um, and uh, they would uh, do it on their own shift, so they wouldn't have to, you know, sort of do it clock OT or, or do it off the clock, so to speak. And they do it in the Best Buy vehicle, a van or something like that, so uh, the employee would not have to use his or her own car. Um, and it's just one of many things that Best Buy is sort of experimenting with. All retailers are seeing a surge of, of e-commerce. Uh, Best Buy's online sales were up 144% last year, more than double. And so they're grappling with ways like, you know, how do we handle all this volume? And uh, Best Buy, like other retailers, including Target, uh, sends a lot of the online orders from its stores. So they got to get to people's houses some way. And rather than using, say, FedEx or UPS and paying them, uh, Best Buy is saying, hey, why not have our own employees do it? Walmart tried to do this before. Did it work? 
Uh, no, <laughs> not at all. It did not work. Uh, Walmart uh, announced this program that they were doing it back in 2017, uh, but it was a little, it was different, certainly. Uh, first off, it was uh, Walmart was asking employees to drop the packages off on their way home after work. And I don't think anybody likes to be bothered uh, after work, especially a, uh, you know, a retail uh, worker. Uh, and they were also doing it in their own cars. So there was a lot of concerns about liability, insurance, you know, what if I get a fender bender while I'm delivering a product for Walmart? So Walmart quietly killed the program after less than a year. Best Buy probably looked at that, looked at the lessons learned there and said, hey, let's do it somewhat differently. And what's your sense of whether or not they can pull it off? I mean, they could probably do it uh, in certain markets. Um, you know, certain employees might like, you know, might uh, not mind uh, doing it. What's interesting, though, is that they're not just delivering packages. Um, they said today on an earnings call that when the employee shows up, you know, with the online order, they might encourage the, you know, the customer to join their new membership program or to, you know, do an in-home sales consultation to say, hey, maybe you could use a new refrigerator or maybe you could use a new home theater. Um, so, you know, I, I don't see this, uh, you know, going coast to coast or, or being huge, um, but, you know, it'll work in, in certain markets and for certain employees. I, I think it's a good idea. All right. Matt Boyle, thanks so much thanks. for that update. We'll keep following it. A few other stories we're watching. Nintendo could be out with a new Switch just in time for the holidays. According to sources, the Japanese company plans to begin assembly of the upgraded device in the next few months and release it by September or October. It would replace the current four-year-old console and is expected to be priced higher than the $299 original. Trade groups representing social media companies, including Twitter and Facebook, are suing the state of Florida over a new law governing political campaigning. The law, which is due to come into effect July 1st, would penalize social media companies that block political candidates from their platforms. The companies could face fines of up to $250,000 a day. Lawmakers in Louisiana and Texas are debating similar bills. And coming up, he saw four companies go public in just under 30 days last year. Next, where GGV Capital's Hans Tung sees the future for e-commerce. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. I want to get a snapshot now of how the retail sector is doing. Bloomberg Markets reporter Kriti Gupta has more from New York. Kriti, some earnings out after the bell. Absolutely, Emily. We have to talk about the retail earnings coming out because we saw it really explode last week. A lot of that fiscal stimulus money is actually now hitting uh, not only people's pockets, but being spent. And you're seeing this show up in the likes of Costco and Gap as well. Now, don't let the share price fool you after hours because they actually reported some pretty good results. Hear me out here. Costco reporting earnings beating estimates across the board. Top line, bottom line, they had a good quarter. Gap as well, boosting annual sales and profit forecast also beating analyst estimates. The stock, though, not doing so well. This is not going to be indicative of what you saw. Intraday trading was very different, had a lot of green on the screen, possibly anticipating some of that good news. I do also want to go to some of the intraday trading, like I just mentioned. Best Buy, Dollar General, both very strong stories. Best Buy in particular, boosting their full year sales forecast after soaring revenue. And get this, Emily, introducing plans for e-commerce delivery. This is something that Walmart tried to do, wasn't able to. Best Buy is going to give it a shot, and investors really like that. To the downside, though, we have Dollar Tree sinking after they said that the freight costs were really denting their bottom line. This is, of course, really going to be key because when you have an earnings story that isn't bright and rosy, investors really don't react very well to it, given this kind of environment of stimulus spending, given that environment of extra cash in the system. The last one I want to get to, though, is that e-commerce story because we did have a story out today that Google and Shopify 
we're partnering to take on Amazon. But let's just take a look at this at a one year chart. You can really see Google has been outperforming Amazon. So has Shopify. And now they're giving Amazon another reason to kind of question some of their e-commerce dominance, Emily. All right, Kriti, thanks so much. Our Bloomberg Markets reporter there. Facebook has also been partnering up with Shopify. More on e-commerce now. The pandemic has, of course, fueled an e-commerce boom across the board with companies like Shopify, Wish, Poshmark, rising to challenge established, established behemoths like Amazon. But how long will this pandemic-driven e-commerce boom last? I want to bring in Hans Tung, managing partner at GGV Capital, who focuses on early stage digital economy companies and currently has over $9 billion in assets under management at GGV. Hans, thanks so much for joining us. Good to have you back. How long do you see this pandemic fueled momentum continuing? Yeah, a lot of people attribute the growth of e-commerce, especially in the US to uh, the pandemic. I think uh, that is partially true, but uh, what we're seeing is that just change of user behavior. More people are used to shop on smartphone and more people are used to pay on smartphone. And the, the ease of uh, uh, ordering and then delivering and even returning is making it a lot easier for you to not leave the comfort of your home and be able to get things quickly done efficiently and have uh, things sent to you and things curated for you in a personalized fashion. So whatever you see on, the, on these uh, mobile shopping apps is increasingly become personalized based on what you have done in the past, what you've purchased in the past and based on the interest you express. So more and more, there's a way to shop um, via e-commerce that is as good, if not better than shopping in store. And so we see that post COVID-19, post the pandemic, that this e-commerce boom um, smartphone will continue to rise. But is there a limit to it, Hans? You asked me that question um, um, over the last uh, six, seven years uh, from different shows I'm, I'm, I'm on. And uh, you look at globally, um, e-commerce penetration rate is over 20% on some of the large uh, countries already, like uh, for example, China, that we, th we think that there, there, there's not gonna be a limit uh, for a while um, and the pie is actually getting bigger. So whereas uh, right back in 2013, 2014, when I first appeared on the show, the debate was uh, Walmart taking on um, Amazon and all the stores will become fulfillment centers and therefore uh, Amazon is gonna have, uh, have issues. Then becomes eBay trying to be, be, be like uh, Amazon. And now you have Facebook and Google trying to partner with Shopify to take on Amazon. I think all, all those efforts while noble uh, are missing the point that, um, uh, it, that Amazon has a unique advantage in e-commerce that to beat them, you have to become more verticalized, which is why we invest in Poshmark, which is why you see Etsy doing well, which is why we invest in Peloton. You got to offer different kinds of experience than trying to just be like them. So what, what's your outlook on some of these more niche e-commerce platforms? And I, you know, obviously you're also an investor in Wish. The stock there has been struggling, you know, in part probably because of the power, continued power of Amazon. I think with the companies that are still finding their ways or improving their operation, a lot of the issues are sort of uh, self-inflicted or uh, more based on execution. When when you see uh, well, Etsy is doing that, they're, 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 they've done well, um, the stock price has gone up dramatically over the last three, four years, you see that there's a way to compete uh, against Amazon do well. You see how Wayfair uh, have done, um, and they have done extremely well um, pre and post COVID-19 or in, this, in the process of doing so. So there's a way to compete and we're obviously still bullish on, on, on wish efforts and uh, uh, StockX um, and Peloton and all the other companies that we're investing in. Now, the popularity of creators and next gen personalities is a huge development in the e-commerce market with all of these TikTok stars hawking products and unboxing. Do you see this shifting the e-commerce landscape dramatically? I think the creator's economy is definitely something interesting. It is more of a buzzword today, but we feel that there's a lot of underlying fundamentals on why it's doing well. Um, you look at a number of monthly active users on Facebook is um, over 3 billion. And uh, YouTube alone, the number of monthly active users is 2 billion. On uh, TikTok is uh, over 600 million. And that's not including statistics from China where Douyin and Kuaishu each has about 700 to 800 million uh, monthly active users. All of them are consuming some form of short form uh, uh, c content. And you look at the number of creators out there where people think themselves as influencers, it's only 50 million. And in terms of the number of um, uh, full-time professionals being influencer, as the number is only 2 million. So there's a lot more 
uh, room for other people to come in to produce content for a lot of eyeballs out there. And in terms of monetization, we have seen all kinds of creative ways beyond just uh, advertising ref share, uh, product placement, um, and NFT, non-fungible token sale, um, uh, tipping, um, and, and sponsored content. So there's more ways to monetize if you can produce content that people want. You've had four IPOs in 30 days last year, Hans, uh, Airbnb, um, Affirm, among them. Do you see that trend continuing with com portfolio companies taking that big leap? Yeah, more, more companies are, are thinking about their, what is their e-commerce strategy, and even more companies are thinking about what is their fintech strategy to, to finance some of those uh, transactions. This is why you see a firm and Afterpay and Klarna doing well. All of them are in the buy now, pay later uh, uh, category. So you don't even have to pay 100% of what you're going to buy today. It can be a month installments over time. That's why you see both Peloton and Affirm, both I made investment in, collaborate so well and grow together. And so the... Uh, addressable market for e-commerce actually gets bigger with innovations on fintech like buy now pay later and you see what square has done with square capital just uh, the kind of innovation that's happening kind of fusing fintech um, e-commerce and social is is incredible it's the best we have ever seen that's why if you ask me uh, where, where does it stop uh, uh, for the near future or medium future the pie just getting bigger and bigger Let's talk about that pie. You know, you've obviously Byte Dance also in your portfolio, looking for a, a potential IPO there. Um, when should we be watching for that to happen, and how big is it going to be? Well, no, no, no one knows for sure. And you see an announcement that uh, Yiming has, has uh, is stepping down in the end of year, um, and so it uh, it seems that the company is growing uh, nicely, and um, there's no immediate plan for IPO. Well. Speaking of TikTok, and you know, I've probably asked you this question before too, but since the landscape is constantly changing, I wonder what you think about the the loyalty to TikTok, given that you know it is about this sort of quick fix, uh, you know, getting that fix in the moment. Do you see TikTok being a sustaining long term platform, or do you think there will be some shiny new platform that eventually comes along and steals that thunder? I think the degree of personalization that TikTok has been able to achieve is amazing. We have, uh, in, you know, I was a frequent traveler before COVID, whether it's going to Sao Paulo in Latam or uh, Bangalore in, in uh, the South, uh, South Asia continent uh, or to uh, um, Bali in Indonesia, whether you're talking to a, um, a Grab driver in Indonesia, a, uh, um, a uh, Swiggy delivery person in Bangalore, or to a iFood or Rappi uh, person uh, doing delivery in um, in Sao Paulo, everybody thinks that when they're playing TikTok, it's tailor made for them, and so the amount and degree of curation is amazing. And so I, I do think that like, both YouTube and TikTok um, have ways to sustain themselves because they constantly come up with so much content and curate it in, in a way that it makes you you know hard to stop and. I remember 10 years ago, people were asking, would you ever cut uh, the cable cord in your, in your household? And more and more doing that, people are doing that today. I'm on YouTube TV. Um, I have Netflix. Um, I have Hulu. Um, I can watch TikTok in Taiwan on our, uh, on our TV. The, the need um, for programming, uh, the set programming is a lot less. And the time that's available for that um, curated personal content is a lot more. And today, more people, more young kids, want to be a YouTube influencer or TikTok influencer than, you know, than a professional job like doctor or astronaut. It's, it's amazing how <laughs> even my kids look at me and says, huh, and dad, right. you know, you, have, you only have 15,000 followers on Twitter. What's wrong with you? Um, I thought you were you know, on some kind of VC list. And, you know, th this unboxing video <laughs> I'm, I'm watching has, you know, 300,000 hits alone. You know, what, 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 is, what is wrong with you? You must, must be that successful. So it is just a different world we live in. Well, Indeed. And well, hopefully some of those young fans and young kids are thinking that they, they would like to travel as exotically as you, thinking about all those places you just mentioned, Hans Tung, <laughs> GGB Capital, Managing Partner. Thank you so much for joining us, as always. So good to have you. Okay, coming up, the amount of capital deployed by venture funds continues to grow, but it isn't going to women-led businesses. We're going to talk to All Race CEO Pam Koska about its latest report on the lack of funding for women. Next, this is Bloomberg.
2020 was a record year for VC funding, and 2021 is trending similarly, but that is not the same story for female founders. A new report from nonprofit All Raise found that funding for teams with at least one woman founder fell by 2.5%, and it's even less for Latinx and African American founders. Joining me now to discuss the slow march to gender equality in Silicon Valley is All Raise CEO. Pam Koska, Pam, thank you so much for joining us. So talk to me about the most surprising and I suppose unsettling findings in this report. Yeah, um, well, 2020 was an unsettling year across the globe, um, but it was really unsettling when we dug into the numbers about where female funding is going and your intro said it all, it's been record deployment of venture capital. And yet there was a significant you know, headwind that we that we put ourselves into, um, thanks to COVID, where funding to female founders or mixed gender teams fell by two and a half percent, and that's some those are the lowest numbers since 2017. So there was not just a black backslide; there was a significant backslide um, this this past year, and a lot of that we attributed to you know. Um, risk reduction, a lot of people not being able to get out and network directly um, and engage directly with one another, um, and also just pattern recognition and a fallback to old styles and um, old muscle memory within the industry. And so there's been some progress and forward, you know, there's been some light spots as we head into Q1 um, and, and kind of the second half the, into Q2 this year, but we shouldn't be complacent and think that we're done. So, uh, you know, I guess the big question is why? I mean, you, if you have more money coming in, why not take that risk on women? Why is it still seen to be more risky to invest in women? It's actually not more risky to invest in, in women. Um, the numbers and the economics clearly show that investing in women is a is a, a prosperous and smart decision. Um, and for every invested dollar, a woman on average will return two times the amount of revenue that her all male counterpart team might. A woman will exit her company faster. So really we have to focus on the fact that there is just bias in the system. And so we look at a couple of different things to make a change. One is to diversify the venture firms themselves. Um, there are too few female venture capitalists in the ecosystem. It's still dominated by uh, white men. 64% of the venture capital firms don't have a single female partner in their ranks. And so when it comes to analyzing um, opportunities and really attracting the type of talent that they want, their networks are closed networks. So we really need to open up those networks by inviting more women into venture capital. Um, number one. And number two is to just re, um, reverse bias in our process of how we look at people but we really um, and, and evaluate opportunities. But we really see this as a networking opportunity. We certainly know for years um, that the evidence out there is that this is not a pipeline problem, but it's an access problem. And opening up people's networks to female founders and especially underrepresented founders and brokering those introductions is going to be key to unlocking you know, the, the potential that is in the market. And the potential is enormous. Um, there's trillions of dollars of value waiting to be mined if we can open up these networks. The picture is even darker for Latinx and Black founders. What did you see there? Yeah, well, the numbers are appallingly small. So um, we are partners with Digital Undivided, which does the Project Diane study. And only you know, 0.64%, so less than a percentage point, still closer to zero than anything meaningful is going to Black and Latinx founders, despite the fact that Black female entrepreneurs are the fastest growing segment. And so there's just really not any, there's been very minimal movement going forward. I think the industry as a whole though is starting to turn their attention towards looking at black female founders and Latinx female founders, underrepresented founders in general, 
and creating vehicles and opportunities to meet these founders, to get access to these founders who they haven't traditionally have access to, and actually to deploy capital for them. But you know, that's part of why All Raise exists is to continue to measure the progress in the industry and what we can do to move the needle forward for Black, Latinx, and other underrepresented founders. So as we come out of the pandemic, what trends are you seeing? Are you worried that Silicon Valley is just going to keep on missing out on the talent of women and Latinx and Black founders? Well, it's certainly if we just look at 2020, there was a lot of headwinds that had stalled the progress that we had seen being made going forward. Um, but there's also tailwinds coming out of 2020. The social reckoning movements that happened in 2020 around race and around gender certainly has put kind of tailwinds in, into our sales. And so when we look at, so there's a lot of promising data going into 2021. Um, today, for example, the IPO of FIGS, um, two, two female co-founder led company um, valued at $4.6 billion today. That's, that's a positive trend. And we've seen a lot of other IPOs as well. Um, the IPO of Bumble, um, the IPO 23andMe, him, Hims and Hers, all of these Poshmark, all with female founders. So we're starting to see the crescendo of um, you know, IPOs and exits and, and continue to shine the light on these incredible opportunities. But we're also seeing that in Q1, we did see an unlocking a little bit of the potential. So there were 687 deals done for female co-founded companies which represented about $9.8 billion in capital. So there's some trends that are indicating things are positive, you know, moving in the right direction that we're unlocking the stasis that we had and in tapping into these networks, but we shouldn't assume that we're done. We'll be interested to continue to track the data in Q2 um, and look at what's happening both in the unicorn um, status and kind of who's in the hopper and who's coming out, but also really there's an opportunity for the industry to give birth to the next Amazon, the next Facebook, um, the next Netflix that would be founded by a female funder uh, or a female entrepreneur. And that's really gonna happen at the highest levels and looking at who are those seed stage companies, who are those uh, series A entrepreneurs and really funding them, opening up your networks, being intentional about meeting some of these incredible founders that are out there. If only more women and more people of color had those opportunities, imagine how different the world could be. Pam Costa, All Race CEO. Thanks so much, Pam, as always, for joining us. Okay, coming up, one of a kind. We'll show you how Rolls Royce is making its luxury cars even more luxurious with the help of technology. That's next. And as we head to a break, take a look at this AMC surging more than 35%, vaulting the company's market value to $13 billion for the first time. Revival in the cinema chain stock has been fueled by retail investors eager to save the movie theater industry. The stock is up more than 1,150% year to date. This is Bloomberg. Rolls-Royce has announced a new program that will allow its most elite customers to commission a car of their own. So far, the automaker has made three individual custom-built cars. One of them has a yacht-like deck that opens to reveal cocktail tables and a parasol. Earlier, we spoke to the company's CEO, Torsten muller Otvos, about the custom cars, as well as how the global chip shortage has impacted the automaker. We haven't seen anything. Obviously, we are part of the BMW Group, and I must say the BMW Group managed that uh, ship topic extremely well due to the fact that they have ordered uh, very early already a uh, sufficient amount. And uh, we, as Rolls-Royce Motor Cars, haven't been affected at all because we also set our order books for uh, chips uh, early and uh, ambitious enough to meet the demand which is now happening. You have um, <coughs> copyrighted Silent Shadow. Um, and now I'm wondering what the transition to EV at Rolls-Royce is going to look like. When are we going to see that car? What is it going to look like? How different will it be to current Rolls-Royces? I mean, um, that is still a secret time to come. <laughs> 
But it will, of course, obviously be a brand new Rolls Royce, rest assured, no worries. But one thing I can tell you, it will not be this car, because we agreed with the clients uh, uh, that this is their car, and there are only three available of them. And uh, we will not copycat that later into other Rolls Royces or whatever. This is a truly exclusive design, and that was meant for the clients. It was even commissioned by the clients themselves together with our uh, designers. So for that reason, that is protected. And uh, the car you are talking about will look different, rest assured. Will it be an electric vehicle? Uh, it will be a vehicle, uh, uh, that's, that's for sure, uh, obviously. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I can't tell you more that moment. Just, just one thing, uh, we are uh, sticking to our plans. I said it already. Uh, we will go definitely full electric uh, uh, in this decade and uh, watch the space and uh, see what happens. Rolls-Royce CEO Torsten muller Otfos there. Who doesn't want a cocktail bar in a car? And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Tune in tomorrow. We're going to be joined by Ian Rogers, Chief Experience Officer of Ledger and the CEO of OutSchool. This is Bloomberg.